Welcome to the Guidelines Podcast, a once every two weeks discussion about applying user-centered design within South Africa. My name is Jonathan Copeland, and on this episode of Guidelines, I sit down with UX designer Homolemo Sechabutle. Having studied a bachelor's degree in financial management sciences, followed by a time working in and learning about user experience design in both a Western and African context, Homolemo has a unique perspective on inclusivity in design. We met up at his home in Pretoria and spoke about his personal journey from studying finance to working in UX, as well as how to best advocate for the user in a business context, and his thoughts on building South Africa's user-centered design community. Enjoy. It's so nice to have you yeah, uh, it's good on, to... on with me. We're actually sitting inside my car. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's, uh, it's good to see you again. It's, it's been a while. It's good to see you too, man. Yeah. Uh, Lemo came up to me in Starbucks. Yes. That's how we got to know each yes. other. I was working on a sketch file <laughs> and he came to me and like, he asked if I'm a designer. Yeah. Yeah. And that started an interesting conversation. First off, um, uh, could you tell me what your name means? My name, Homolemo, it means it is well. It is well. Yes. That's beautiful, man. Well, <laughs> it, is, it is well to have you here. <laughs> um, on your personal website, yeah. your, you have four sentences that come up. You say, start with my heritage, design with my heart, deliver a culture, and my process is unique. That, that's, quite a, that's quite a value proposition to put forward. What is your, what is your process? How did you get involved in doing design uh, what's been your journey and how did you reach the place yeah. that you're in now and yeah. doing design so I guess when people talk about design many times art comes to the head right yeah that's what many people think design is and later I realized that I'd been in design throughout my life it's only got formalized at a certain time in my life that this is what you're actually doing sure um, so personally i've always liked to solve problems yeah i see society i see i'm a patterns kind of person i see patterns in society mm -hmm. and i've always wanted to know how can i solve it how can i be empowered to help other people solve it um so i spent some time in netherlands i had a friend over there who had the startup called whoop world and uh, i think that's where i first got exposed to more the tech side of things mm -hmm. um and so he needed help with just some concepts and design and testing user flows, mm. which are all words that I didn't even know at the time, mm. right? It just made sense that you need to test with people. Yeah. Does it work the way they actually want to interact with it? Mm. And later, obviously, I understood that these are user flows and mm. all the stuff you learn in, um, in design. Yeah. Um, quick interjection. Yes. I love how, I think, and we'll get to this, but like you're, you're a global citizen. Yeah, well, I guess I've yeah. been fortunate to travel to many different places. I think given that I'm a South African, we've got such a diverse community, yeah. but we don't have an integrated diverse community. So what does uh, that mean? So we coexist. We don't really know each other's backgrounds. So, okay. And we don't make an effort to really like get to know the person. Ooh, so why do you think the way you think? So, okay. you know, and um, these things always kind of keep us separated. And given our historical past, it is a process to come to a point of, totally. and you have to be intentional about it. Yeah. And that's what design is, yeah. right? It's the int intentional solution under a set of constraints, coming up with an intentional solution to a problem, sure. given the constraints that you have. That's and that's on. design, so yeah. yeah. Um, so I, I interrupted you, we were like, you were telling me about your journey, but that, uh, that's amazing. Yeah, so um, that's where I started, got exposed to design in Netherlands. Then I spent some time in the US, um, and I met a very pivotal person in my journey, um, Patrick, I'll mention his name. Okay. He had studied medicine for like four years and um, I was still studying. I was trying to do CFA level one. Mm. We had Starbucks and um, I'm studying the whole time and he comes and he's busy doing these little calligraphy drawings. And I ask him, when do you work, dude? It's like, I am working. It's like, you can't come in shorts and whatnot and you call this work. <laughs> and he just genuinely looked happy with what he was doing. And there came a point where he told me, he's like, dude, I've gotten to know you. I know the kind of person you are. I think you should consider going into UX design. I don't know what that was, right? Mm -hmm. Product design, UX design. And he told me his story, how he transitioned from studying for medicine four years, then did UX design course, and he was loving what he was doing. Sure. And uh, so that got me thinking. I came back to South Africa for a year. I was uh, doing some management, and I was like, I'm bored. Mm. You know, this doesn't 
challenge all my facets because usually we get told you left brain or right brain. Yes. And this is how it works. Either you left brain, you can do numbers, so you do maths, investment, accounting, mm. or finance, which mm. I studied financial management. Yeah. Or you're an arty person and you're doing music or art or and that's generally the streams that were always kind of created for me. Mm. Coming into UX, I realized you can engage both sides of your brain, yeah, both, both yeah. the analytic and, and the creative, yeah. right? And together, actually a powerful tool. So. I think that's why you have two sides to the brain. Yeah, 100%. Um, not just to focus on the yeah. Side, yeah. So that, that's been sort of my journey. Patrick was a very key figure in that. And since then, he's a good friend of mine, but I always call him my mentor, mm. right? Um, just because he's... Uh, He's so well informed with with what's happening in UX and he's further ahead in my journey. And I find it important to have mentors and people that are much further ahead to just keep you. 100%. And, and not that they tell you what to do because you also bring something to the table. Mm. But to bounce things off them yeah. is, is very key for me. Okay. Yeah. I guess that's an interesting, you, you started learning about yeah. UX. You first heard about yeah. it whilst being in the Netherlands yeah. from Patrick and Starbucks. No, Patrick I met in the US. Okay. In Netherlands, it was from another friend with a startup. His name is Maurice. Okay, cool. I got exposed to that. Then in the US, okay. Patrick solidified it. Okay. And then I did a UX course in, in San Francisco. Okay. And that's when, obviously, it became a solidified understanding of what this is, what's the process, and all those kind of things. That's an interesting journey. Um, in Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick, he speaks about this thing about the lateral drift and mm. to, to come up with something unique. Oftentimes you don't know how to necessarily go forward, so you drift and then you, through that drifting, find something unique. And I think it sounds like you, you started on the way to do finances yeah. and then you weren't that sure. And so that drift happened and then I within would, that... You... I would say it's, it wasn't even about surety. I think the motivation... Like I said, from, from when I was young, I was always in design but didn't know it. Okay. My motivation to do financial management was that I realized in South Africa a lot of people are bad in their finances. So I wanted to solve a problem. So sure. okay. That's the only reason I stayed here. Okay, right? sure. And I look at our situation, we're the most unequal country worldwide. Yeah. Right? And so I was like, how do we stop complaining and add to fixing this problem? Sure. So I needed to learn the tools to be able to inform this. Okay. And that was my motivation. Okay. Right? And so I thought financial management would give me that. But then I realized UX actually just touches way more aspects, yeah. right? Um, there's user experience in every industry. Mm. And that for me was like, whoa, mind blowing. Okay, this is it. Um, my second day doing the course um, in San Francisco at General Assembly, um, my day two, I was like, I know, I, sh I, was, I was born to do this. Cool. Yeah. That's, uh, that's really interesting. <laughs> With... Uh, so from that from that course yeah. in San Francisco, how long was that? And that was what, a, what did it entail and what was after that for you? Yeah. So that was a three month immersive course, right? And I think what I got from that, so it was three months immersive, but almost a six month process because there was an outcomes, you had a career coach who is really challenging you as a person. Mm, that's you know? valuable. Um, really growing you, why do you feel insecure? What are you growing in? Those kind of things. Um, so what I got from that was you being taught by an industry expert I was being taught by people that are in the industry it's not just a teacher who's teaching you something and they're not practicing it mm -hmm. there's someone who's living this thing and they're teaching you practically this is how it is in the industry this is what you need to know this is where it's coming from yeah. this is the projection of this from start to where we're at now this is where you fit in this you know so it's encouraging having someone like walk you through and you have confidence because the person teaching you is in the industry Okay. So for me, it gave me that kind of confidence that you can go anywhere mm. and apply this. You've learned the proper, you, you've gotten the right information. Okay. Very practical and based yeah. in reality. Yeah. And so you worked on that for three months? For three months. And immersive. Was in San Francisco. Yeah. So, I mean, from nine to five. And then because I'm coming from an analytical side, I thought, yes, I need to put in extra hours. Sure. Okay. So I had some friends. We would stay afterwards until 10 almost every day. Sure. Right. Because we felt like we're not from art background, and we're gonna struggle. Yeah. Um, but it paid off in the end. You just learn to grind out, right? And just be dedicated. And because UX is such a process thing, you start to value the process. Even the process going through this course, you value the process. Um, I think I'm so in love with process now that end goals, they're great, but I start valuing just the journey in between. And that's the kind of person I am. The journey is so 
so much more important than just the end result. Mm. Yeah, that's amazing. Oh, now I'm bouncing up and down. Yeah, this yeah, is great. You, you keep is, me on course. This is so great. <laughs> um, so, as with, so you, you spent this three month in yeah. depth yeah. after hours hustling yeah. course on UX. Yeah. What was your next steps after that? So after that, obviously you need to make a decision. Okay, <clears throat> am I going to stay? And I'd, I had stayed in the US a year prior to that. That's how I got to meet um, Patrick and all. So I had a community over there. Cool. And so that made it a bit easier for me. I could stay longer because San Francisco is super expensive, mm. right? Um, and so all that coming from my pocket or my family also helping was not the cheapest thing with the South African Rand. No. Um, so yeah, just meeting some of my friends and some of the people in my community who are industry leaders within their um, expertise. Some are deaf people, some are salespeople. I think they gave me a lot of advice and really just mentorship on like, oh, okay, what are you trying to do? You know, the goal shouldn't just be, I just want a job at Facebook or this. Or, or, what is it that you're really trying to get out of this? And because my biggest goal is problem solving, I was like, well, I want to actually spend a season in South Africa. Okay. Right. And I think um, a decision was made that I'm going to spend at least a year in South Africa. I wanted to be around <coughs> my family because... <clears throat> I'm big on impacting the people that have supported you. Hmm. The info that I've learned, how does it impact their lives? Mm, that's amazing. Right? Before I even go to some company and put my time in, and I'm big on time, um, no one can pay you enough for your time. Hmm. That's how I think. You, don't, you can't remake time, you can't extend your time. So I thought, let me invest in my family, teach them some of the stuff that I know, and set them up to be in a better position. So that going forward, regardless where I am in the world, I know they're good. Um, and any company I'm working with, I'm going to serve them well and whatnot. But also get the South African community to a place. Because, because we live in such a crime-ridden or like some of the problems we have, we're just creative problem solvers naturally. We're forced to be. Hmm. And we just don't know it. So just also tapping into the community here that, hey, here are some tools, things like design thinking and all these things that you can apply to the problems we have and we'll come up with amazing things sure okay. right and that that was my goal coming back here and starting community and doing some projects back in south africa yeah. okay and since coming back what's been some of the the work that you found to be the most useful that you've been working on or so like so one of the things my mother uh, a friend of mine and my ex-headmaster they working with the school and i put this team together because i always think in patterns like who would go well together mm. how do they solve that problem mm. what's the process mm. right i don't necessarily have to be there but i can see that this is what's missing put it together let's see how it solves this problem so there was a school in a in a township area that we've put this team together and they've been doing amazing work and my goal is not to necessarily be the go-to person is how do we empower people like a bottleneck yeah. yeah how do we empower people set teams up and they problem solve mm. So that was one. Um, last week, a partner of mine and I hosted a hackathon. Um, we started an organization called um, WHI, it's Healthcare Innovation. Um, and it's, it's to engage with the problems in the healthcare sector. Sure. Um, in South Africa, if you've got private insurance, you're a bit better off, right? Um, the reality is that those that don't have private insurance, you're going to wait in lines, you're going to, and it's not that they're getting bad service, it's just that it's limited, right? You've got limited time. And so we're like, we've got these doctors who are true heroes that no one talks about, and the nurses and the admin at um, this hospital, Baragwana, which is the biggest in the Southern Hemisphere. How do we help them in any way that we can? And so that's how um, Vitz Healthcare Innovation came about. And we hosted a hackathon, came up with some solutions, which now we'll start implementing within the next coming weeks. Sure. Okay. Um, so my goal is how do we impact society? I think if I just had an overall thread is how do we impact societies to just really give people a chance to make it in life? Sure. Okay. Right. Yeah. So there's that strong emphasis on, on people and yeah. community and yeah. society. Okay. Uh, something I'd like to, to switch gears slightly yes. and go back to what yeah. you mentioned. You, you said that you studied finances. Yes. So I studied financial management. So, okay, my motivation for studying this, one was that, okay, how do I impact society, especially the, the previously disadvantaged people in South Africa because they have a bad relationship with finance. Mm -hmm. 
But another reason was that my brother did accounting. So I thought, well, if he can do it, I can do it. This is an easy <laughs> process, yeah. right? And so I studied financial management. Um, but afterwards, the way I was taught, it wasn't very practical, right? It was all theoretical. Um, so the education didn't um, prepare me for industry. It was all this knowledge, which was good in turn because I could pass on this knowledge to other people. But it was too small scale for my liking. So, um, so that's why I think it was pretty easy for me to switch out of financial management into okay. UX design to something more concrete where I can see firsthand the impact because it's user-centered design, mm. right? It's literally touching that person that I'm trying to impact. Sure. Whereas financial management, I can help in the processes, but... Mm. Not really sure if I'm impacting this end user. Okay. Right? I might be am impacting a bank or an institution, which might still not help the end user. So, yeah, that was my engagement with financial management. I guess it was just I could do numbers. Yeah. I was okay. good at them. I think that's so often the journey of a high school yeah. graduate. You, yeah. you, you go with what's available rather than what you, you need to actually yeah. be doing. Yeah. And you figure out over the period of a couple of years, yeah. what you actually meant to be doing yeah. and you pivot. Which, which was tough because, I mean, UX design didn't even exist for me in that yeah. time, yeah. right? So how do you even know? I mean, there are people that are being born today and what they're going to be doing doesn't exist yet. Yeah. And so I think we also need to change the narrative, right? And just start st empowering the strengths that you have and really growing what's in you and then you're allowed to apply it to where you think it fits. Mm. Because right now we're already being driven in a narrative already and like, oh, well, I'm going to be an accountant yeah. or financial manager because uh, I can do numbers. Yeah. Uh, I had a fascinating conversation with a, a, a grade 12 student last mm. week and she's, she's good. She's taking all the science modules and that kind of thing. And she really didn't, still doesn't really know what she wants to work in. And we ended up also started telling her about UX and mm. because she, she'd done some programming, but she didn't see herself as being a programmer, yeah. but she also didn't want to do, like she wanted to do something with computers because yeah. I mean, computers are yeah. like, that's, that's the growth industry. Um, and she didn't even know about it. Yeah. And I think it was so cool to be able to tell her about this incredibly, and she's also very engaging yeah. people wise. Yeah. And so I think like so many times people will graduate from high school and they'll like, they'll, they'll have a skill set, but they don't know what to align it with yes. most effectively. Yes. Um, what would you suggest to a high school uh, student? I mean, UX or, yeah. and not, not necessarily we're into UX, but mm. how would you effectively go about choosing? So another thing, when I was still in university, I started a tutoring business, right? Yes, I saw that. <laughs> so um, my goal, what I did realize was that generally we say someone's not good at something. Mm. But what I realize is that that's not necessarily true. Sometimes they just lack confidence or something. There's a trauma that's happened to them that's blocked them off in a certain industry. So um, for me, it's more dealing with their confidence issue because then it opens up what they can do because they've already decided I'm not good at that. Right. And they've, they're looking in a certain direction and it's already tough to even open their eyes to the possibility. But when someone's confident and they can see themselves in the right light, then many other things open up, right? Now they're willing to be entrepreneurs. They're not like, I'm too stupid, mm -hmm. right? They're willing to be an engineer where at first maybe they weren't doing well at math just because they weren't taught well or they just didn't have confidence. They weren't doing homework. It's as simple as that, mm -hmm. right? Um, so the biggest thing that I focus on is impacting the people. How do we speak into the people and impact their identity? Like you are worth it. You are better than this. You can do it. Mm -hmm. Once you do that, you don't really have to even tell people. They start seeing opportunities, sure. right? And then they start asking, how do I engage with that opportunity? Mm. Which is easier to lead them down that road rather than tell them you should be that, mm. right? And so I think my biggest goal with, with uh, students, let's say, it would be how do we bring out what's already in them, mm. right? They were born with it. How do we bring it out? Mm. Once it's out, then they can engage. They can look around. Business is solving problems, right? Mm. They can look at all the problems around and say, I pick that one. Yeah. And we give them the tools. Mm. And then I think we, we're in a better position, I think. Mm. That's interesting. Uh, um, <laughs> Don't I'm, know how to execute yeah. it so well, but uh, that's, yeah. that's my thought. Yeah. yeah. Um, my last guest on Guidelines was CEO of the Sand Dollar Design, Yaku van der Hever. Mm. And uh, he was telling me about how UX design is design that is driven by data 
and business. Now, being someone who has studied finances, uh, how has that shaped your mindset with regard to design? So I'm, I'm big on analytics. Okay. Um, I'll give you an example. Just uh, did this one website for this lady. She's an educational psychologist. Had a design laid out, what information's important, what not, and had a button of like, okay, contact us. People weren't really going through that. They were just getting her number and calling her straight. Mm. And I had a form where they could fill out the info, get back to us, mm. right? And based on that, those analytics, we've changed the design. You've made, we've made the number more readily available because mm. this is what people are coming for. Mm. So for me, coming from an analytical side of things, mm. um, I'm a very data-driven mm. person. I wouldn't necessarily say I agree 100% that UX is... Uh, how did you say it? Uh, it is design that is closely aligned with business objectives and uh, data-driven. It is, yeah. but I think it also intersects user goals, right? Okay. So for UX to be effective, mm. it's the overlap of what is the user trying to achieve mm. and what are the business, uh, what is the business trying to achieve? Yes. At that overlap, that is the sweet spot for user experience design. Okay. Yes. Right. And from there, you're going to draw analytics that help you shape those things. Okay. So that's that's my that's my view on on that. Uh, financial management. I think it just helped me not be too pie in the sky. I understand business. I understand mm. what they're trying to do. Most businesses at the bottom line, they're trying to make a profit. Yes. Yeah. Right. With that in place, how do we make sure? that the user is also getting what they want. Okay. Right. Make it a win-win. For me, it's make it a win-win. Okay. Then, then we're winning. So aligning business along with user goals, along with, and then using data to, to yes. create that. Okay. Yes. For me, that's, that's how I see it. That's where I see the sweet spot of user experience design because no one feels shortchanged. Okay. Right. The user's getting what they're looking for and they're not being manipulated because that's dark UX, which is another thing. Yeah, dark get. patterns. Yeah. yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, I guess how I see it. I hope I answered that. <laughs> Interesting. I think uh, I'm going to approach it from, a, from another angle. Uh, what does, how do I put this? What does, what does it look like when design is, is working with business goals? Okay. Yeah. Um, so, what does it look like when design is working with business objectives and, and, and the two of them are in sync together? And imagine you're answering this to a someone who's working in corporate yeah. and he's trying to advocate yeah. for UX and for yeah. user-centered design within a business corporate environment yeah. where design maybe doesn't have a seat at the table. Yes, yes. So, and this, this has been one of the shortcomings I've seen with designers. They don't know how to speak business language. Yes. And I think this is one of the things that I've I've had an advantage in, if I could put it in inverted commas, mm. is I understand I understand the, the clientele, the, the stakeholders, mm. right? Understand their viewpoint. Mm. Their first focus is we're running a business, we're giving a service, we want to make a profit from this thing. Mm. Right? Now in terms of design, how do I align with that? You're trying to achieve more more sales and all that stuff. Mm. How you're going about it is not actually effective. And this is where UX design comes along. Like mm. to make that more effective and smoother, these are the principles you need to apply, right? And you can literally show with numbers that the impact it will have on business revenue, the impact it will have on morale within the company, depending where you're applying it, mm. right? The impact it has when business is doing well, we can incorporate more things within the company for the employees as well. So everyone is winning. Mm. That's, that's how I bring it across to the business side. Like CEO, if I'm talking to the CEO, you're running this big machine, this big corporation. It's got employees, they're your stakeholders, it's got outside customers, it's got these goals and the vision that you're trying to get to. Hmm. You need customers to line up with this for you to reach that. Sure, okay. So you also need to be solving their needs, which is business. You're okay. solving a problem. Sure. UX design is a tool, or design is a tool that you use to meet that need. Okay. And that's, that's how I go about it. And I think then they get it a bit better, but then they can also start putting it in their own words. Mm. I also don't want to give business people design words mm. because when, th when they speak to other people, they need to put it in their own words, mm. right? And if they come with design thinking and all this lingo and jargon, mm. it's just like, what are you saying? And because they don't know it so well, mm. 
they fall flat and then so they, education is a large part of it it but is educating users and partners and and partners and the key stakeholders but not coming across as like i'm educating you you don't how know. how how does one effectively do that conversation okay right uh and <laughs> this now is going to communication which is another thing altogether yes a designer needs to be able to communicate what they're doing yes right and, and i think data is tightly aligned with that definitely so communicating the value uh that maybe the abstract thing that hasn't been proved yet yeah. but also the data on definitely okay. definitely i th you know even before we get to data because we've got most a lot of big companies have um dirty data i'll put it that way what does from, that mean from what i've seen the systems that they used in back in the day was like patch up here patch up there the the data is not clean like you've got five records of the same person in one in one aspect that calls him Jonathan in another one it calls him Johnny in another mm. one it's called yeah and it's it's not aligned so you might think there's five different people but that's one person okay that's dirty data it needs to be cleaned up and the record shows that this is the same human being okay right you might infer the wrong information from seeing five different records but it's the same person okay don't want to get sidetracked yeah okay. um how was I? No, I'm losing my train of thought. No talking uh, to... We were talking about um, business, and yes. we were talking about um, how one can communicate effectively. So, so, so really, I guess coming back to communication is not undermining people, right? Okay. Understanding everyone is a is an expert in their field or they're a professional, mm. right? I'm not going to speak down to you and, and make it seem like you're dumb. Mm. You really do know what you're doing. Mm. I'm just going to try communicate. I think Einstein said it, and I'm going to butcher this quote that if you can't, uh, <laughs> if you can't uh, explain it to a five-year-old, then you don't know it well enough. Yeah. I'm attributing it to Einstein because that's what I've seen on the memes. It might not even be. <laughs> it's Einstein. all about the memes, man. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so yeah, if you can't really explain it in someone else's language, you don't know it well enough. Sure. Okay. And for me, that's the importance of explaining it to business. You, you, you're coming and speaking their language, mm. and this goes way beyond even business. And, and my biggest thing is impacting society. When you come to a society, be able to speak, communicate with them in their language. Okay. Right, come across to their side and bring across what you're trying to do. Okay. And I, I think that's why for me, UX design or even design thinking, design so readily lends itself to different aspects, whether you're impacting society, whether it's business, whether it's just even relationships or your own even life, right? It's, mm. You can apply it in so many aspects. Mm. Okay. Now, on that topic, I'd like to come 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 across to society. Yes. Okay. Um, I think that you're in a. I mentioned I think the word global citizen came to mind earlier, and I think that you're in this unique position where you've worked in usability design in lots of different social groups. Mm. You're a South African. You've gone overseas. You've had experience there. You've been trained there. You've come back here. Um, what has been some of the differences between the states's UX? culture and South Africa's UX culture so firstly we must understand obviously Silicon Valley San Francisco they're far ahead yeah right the conversations that they get to have in the bar we go to a conference for yeah right so it's so readily available in the US whereas it's not over here mm. that information I, I would put it this way information is so readily available it always puts them a step ahead mm. the technologies that they're dealing with are much further than what we're dealing with, mm. right? Um, Wi-Fi is really available. Most people have uh, internet access everywhere. It's not the same over here. Mm. That's why we're further behind. We're only starting to do uh, online shopping, right? Mm. We, we're only starting now. It's starting to grow and boom. That's the norm that side, mm. right? You order everything online. You do this. You call Uber. You call this. So we're just different. I guess I don't want to make it seem like we're behind. Mm. We didn't know this information, mm. but the context is also key. Okay. Design thinking can be applied worldwide and it might seem like they're far ahead, which they are because they've been doing it longer. Mm. But in context of South Africa, we've got different problems. What are some of those gaps that we can fill in, in terms of design culture, design thinking culture within South Africa's design community? I guess what I, re what I experienced that side was that people were willing to help. Okay. It, it wasn't a crab in the bucket mindset, which I find a bit more readily in South Africa. What does crab in the bucket so, mean? <laughs> yeah. So crab in the bucket is if you leave crabs and one tries to climb out, you don't even have to look after them. The other crabs just pull it down. Right? Sure. Okay. That's the crab in the bucket. So over there, 
people are willing to give you information they're willing to help what do you need where are you trying to go oh, i'll introduce you to so and so i will do if we can get more of that in our society yeah. and really just i'm really trying to help you yeah. right and understand that my journey is my journey yeah and i will get what's coming on my journey yeah. and i i wish the best for you and if i can help you i'm gonna help you mm. right i think if we can get more of that in south africa I think we're a people group that's very creative and we've got more to offer than we know. Mm. So I think that is by far the biggest key, the biggest difference that I've noticed mm. is being able to help each other, being able to refer each other, being able to give each other access to information. Like here's a link where you can learn this stuff. Here's this, here's that. Send it out. Mm. Not being intimidated, mm. right? You're also good enough. You also know this stuff. So that's been the key difference, I would say, more than anything. But I also think South Africans would be super successful over there. Mm. Because of the problems we engage with over here are so complex, mm. you think differently, mm. naturally. Mm. You're always aware, right? We've got crime over here, so you always have to look at your surroundings. In design, that's important. You look at many other things. When I, when I came back here, and I know I'm shifting a bit, um, inclusivity for me was a big thing i think there was a time one of the apps couldn't recognize my face right with these filters and you understand that clearly there wasn't a person who's of my pigmentation or a representation of me on that table right and i think we're further behind in our country in terms of having people of color or previously disadvantaged at the right tables sure okay we're much further behind. We don't mobilize as well as they do in the US. We are not as vocal. We are not as, you know, we're not pushing. Specifically within creative design work. I think just beyond that, but okay, yes, yeah. creative design. Because for me, design is not just, um, obviously we're speaking about UX design, but yes, when I yeah. look at design, like I said, and it's a quote from Mike Montero, who's a very uh, colorful speaker, hmm. if I could put it that way. But he said, um, design is coming up with a solution, um, intentional solution to a problem under a set of constraints. Hmm. That's design. Yeah. Right. Uh, Matthias Duar from Google Design Team calls it art within constraints. Art within constraints. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, I'm, I'm not so sure I'm too, um, I'm too fond of art within constraints because <laughs> okay, cool. art comes across too right brainy and everyone's <laughs> like, oh, okay, you're arty farty people. Yeah. That's why they call us the lipstick people. You just make it look nice. Anyway, <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I guess it's, it's not much. It's just a further ahead. When mm. you've been in something much longer, you are just better at it. You have more industry experts. What we would call industry experts here would probably be just normal designers there or media or just middle level designers that side okay right so they're much further ahead that's okay. the only difference so creating a culture of of sharing and, incl and inclusivity yes. and building our culture together yes that's that's the heart of this podcast it's to it's to get a communication going yeah. and to to share this knowledge that we have as a ux South african community yeah. um something that you touched on uh you didn't say this word exactly but you spoke about ethnographic yes. studying yes. can you unpack that briefly what is ethnographic study how can you apply ethnography in your designing and research so i guess when when you do this you a lot of it is people watching right just really watching people in their own environments how they engage with things on mm. day to day mm. right um studying so they also do this in development finance which is a nice thing you realize design is being applied everywhere in development finance, they say, don't come to a community and say, this is the solution. Mm. You come in there and w together with them, analyze actually what's happening. So they see it for themselves from an outside view, but then give them the tools like, hey, this is how we can engage with these, with these problems. Mm. So I don't want to use nice words because we've got normal listeners to the podcast. Yes, yeah. um, just really just observing how are things functioning. Okay. Right. How does this community or this culture or this people group engage with certain things? Why do they engage with things like that? Yeah. Right. And based on that, um, I keep bouncing up and down. There's a quote that says, before you remove a boundary line, pause long enough to ask yourself why it was put there in the first place. Hmm. Right. And so I think ethnographic research is really, it really touches on that. Hmm. Right. What are those boundary lines people have put in? Why are they there? Hmm. If I'm going to move this, what is the impact of that, yeah. right? Um, whew, running out of steam. Interesting, but. that's solid. <laughs> yeah, I got you. Um, 
before we close, yes. I'd like to ask a question. Yes. Um, you mentioned that quote by Einstein, we're explaining something very simple. <laughs> that, that meme by Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> that Einstein meme. Yeah. Um, if you were to explain yeah. UX design as simply as possible, how would you explain it? In Gee, summary, was, yeah. I, I wish you prepared me for that. <laughs> um, UX design. I mean, it's in the word user experience design, right? It's user centered design. So like I said, I keep mentioning what design is just so that people don't think it's an art. I think for me, the key word there is design, mm. right? Because there's other kinds of design, user experience design, coming up with an intentional solution to a problem under a set of constraints. Mm. So that is design, but the focus is the person who's going to engage with mm. the solution. I think it, that's the easiest way I can put it for any layman to understand. The main focus is the person who's going to interact mm. with this solution. Okay. And we focus on you, your needs, and how do we meet them mm. through the design we've come up with. Mm. Homolemo, thank you so much for spending time with me and having this conversation. Oh, uh, thank I you. found it incredibly inspiring and uh, interesting. Wow. Um, if people want to work with you or they want to reach out to you, what yeah. would be the best way to get in touch with you? The best way, um, I'll be launching my website now because I'm doing um, private consulting and uh, just started up a small agency. So right now, I think I'm working on a couple of projects, but it's my cell number, I guess. Okay, um, I'll put that in the show notes. Yeah, my cell number, you can contact me there and you can check out on the website and we can get in touch um, through that. LinkedIn is also another way that you can contact me. Cool. Um, and yeah, I, I hope you're contacting me. I'm very big on uh, community projects mm. that I'm willing to do voluntarily, cool. right? Um, but the other stuff also, you can also contact me for that. Um, yeah, and let's build a community. Yeah, dude, I'm fully on board with that. Yeah. Onwards and upwards. Come Lemba, thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Whoa, it's so hard. Oh. <laughs> it's really hard. Let's get out of the car. Mate, <laughs> right. oh.